Hey gang, I am Joe Edelman and welcome to The Last Frame Live. We got a little photo news, I'll do a shot breakdown of the cover shot, and of course, The Last Frame Q&A. And already got a couple good questions in, but hopefully we're going to get a lot more and I'll do my best to answer all of your questions in the next 60 minutes. Now listen, if you're watching live, you know the drill. Please leave me a note in the chat. Let me know who you are and where you're watching from. And hey, if you're watching the replay, then no worries. Thanks for stopping by. Drop a comment below the video so that I know you were here. Already, gosh, we got a lot of people here. Keith is here from France. Danny in Vegas. I got Felipe down in Brazil. Cooley in uh, Indiana. Let's see, Gerhardt's here in Austria. Calvin up in, uh, let's see, Maine. I got Eric in Mexico City. All of you are truly part of a growing global community of photographers in over 100 countries who tune in to watch The Last Frame every week. And for that, I will work really hard to help you with your photography in the next 59 minutes, okay? And of course, look, it would help a lot more people learn about The Last Frame. If you could do me a solid, hit that thumbs up. It doesn't hurt, it doesn't cost you anything. It's not for my ego. The more thumbs up, the more YouTube will recommend the show to other photographers. That's just how the algorithm is. And of course, while you're down there, feel free to go ahead and hit that share button. Let your photography friends know that we are streaming live on YouTube right now. Or you can go ahead and share the link, lastframe.live. I will, <coughs> excuse me, I will go ahead and get you a copy of that for the chat. I apologize, I thought I had it queued up and it's not there. Uh, but Twitter, Facebook, they're the fastest way to get the word out. So you know what? I've already got a couple really good questions. And I'm really serious, gang. If you're here, what are you struggling with with your photography, right? What can we, what can we talk about that's going to help you improve or that is maybe going to help you get a more solid perspective on why you should be trying certain things? You know, that's the stuff I really love to get into. So you know what? Let's skip news because there's nothing super exciting this week. It's, you know, a bunch of the sky is falling topics about AI and all that stuff. So we're going to let that go by. But look, I do have a couple opportunities. And one's a freebie for you to do some learning with me. So this organization has been so kind to make this available to the general public. I want to make sure that you know all about this. So this weekend, now you'll notice on my calendar, it says February 26th. I'm doing a presentation, which I am. Um, but this is the Coastal Camera Club, which is in Delaware in the United States. They are hosting a two-day event. So it's Saturday the 25th and Sunday the 26th. On Saturday, they have Colleen Minnick, who is just this amazing – I mean, she's a photographer. She's an author. She's a bunch of stuff. But she's just got this incredible – since what I love about her work, you know I'm a color person, right? So this is incredible sense of color and mood with her work. Just amazing stuff. In fact, here, let me go ahead and let me grab that URL. I will share her URL. But they are opening both of these talks. Colleen's talk on Saturday, my talk on Sunday. They are opening them up to the public for free. Now, it's first come, first serve. I can tell you that they have a 1,000 seats available. And as it stands right now, They've got about 600 plus filled. So there's a little bit of room. You do have to register, right? So I'm going to share with you. Here's the important link. Use that link to go ahead and register. This link is not currently below the video, but I will add it as soon as we get off the air. You can sign up for free, attend both, learn a lot. Okay, um, I'm going to be doing a presentation called Understanding Creativity. It's honestly one of my most favorite presentations to do. Now, just so that there is no confusion, next Thursday, that's February 28th, I'm also doing a presentation on my own. It's called Mastering Creativity. It's a deep dive in how to find the cool ideas. So you can actually think of these as part one and part two. Right, so I'm not as nice as the people in Delaware. You got to pay ten bucks to attend mine. But if you pay the ten bucks to attend mine, you get a digital download afterwards with a lot of really cool ideas and tips and suggestions. You also get access to be able to watch or rewatch the presentation for 72 hours after the presentation occurs. Uh, there are still a few seats left 
for this one next Thursday. So if you really want the biggest bang for your buck, you're going to do Understanding Creativity for free this weekend. I'll be presenting again for the Virtual Photo Beach Bash because this used to be an outdoor event that happened in the summertime, but now they're doing it virtually, right? Um, so I'll be presenting that for the Coastal Camera Club in Delaware. They have opened it up for free to the world, right? So if you do sign up, make sure you give them a thank you in the chat during the presentations because a lot of camera clubs won't do that. And then next Thursday, you can do the Mastering Creativity, which is taking that understanding and really refining and drilling it down and putting it all to use. And look, I'll be really honest with you. Some of you may think, oh, well, let me just go right to the mastering part with getting all the cool ideas. Yeah, you know, you'll get usable stuff. But if you're going to pay the 10 bucks, do the free course too, because that way you're going to get the whole picture and you're going to really understand what's going on here. Okay. Uh, also, if you are coming to WPPI, I hope you're coming to WPPI, or if you're not, you ought to be. They've dropped the price. It's like, $99 for the entire conference. You can still get a free trade show pass, attend the trade show for free. Uh, trade shows aren't what they used to be. They're just not. Uh, Imaging USA, Nashville, PPA's event. Actually, the trade show is pretty impressive. Uh, WPPI is doing a good job of kind of building theirs back up, but still not what it used to be. Just keeping it real, right? They'll probably be mad at me for saying that, but it is what it is. Um, honestly, the real value at $99, it's all the education that you get to participate in. On Monday, March 6th, I will be doing a photo walk. Um, it may be sold out, but there may be a waiting list, so you can get on the waiting list. Uh, it's called Posing Without Posing, and it's really, a, it's, I'm excited because it's my opportunity. You hear me talk all the time. Posing is a four-letter word. Don't use four-letter words. Well, this is a chance where I get to not only talk about it, but demonstrate how I direct models and portrait subjects without using the P word and without using the same poses over and over and over and over again. Everything I do is based on the subject. But WPPI runs, um, the, the actual show runs the 7th through the 9th. There are some events beforehand on the 5th, uh, but basically 7 through 9 is the main event. I'll be there on uh, the 6th doing my presentation. And um, on the 7th, I will be doing portfolio reviews on the trade show floor. So you can actually sign up and have your images reviewed by me and all that kind of cool stuff. So you'll find all that information there. Uh, I will share this link in the chat. And I'm not done. Three more important ones. All right. And believe me, if you're wanting to learn from me like one on one, you want to do it in the first half of this year because I'm not going to be doing a whole bunch of in person stuff. The second half of the year, but I can't tell you exactly why yet. That's some cool news that's coming together, um, but I'm feeling pretty good about it. So I'll share it soon, right? So the first one is um, the weekend of March was the 25th. Oh, gosh, I got to go back and look now. It's 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, Oh, sorry, 17 and 18. God, I'm glad I looked. March 17th and 18th. So starting with a Friday night, Austin, Texas, Precision Camera and Video, uh, Mastering Creativity, if you happen to live in Austin, you don't need to sign up and pay me 10 bucks next week. You can come and see it in person for free. This isn't going to be streamed live. This is an in-person. you got to come to the camera store and see it. And by the way, if you've never been to Precision Camera, oh my God, it's like photographer heaven. If you're married, leave your credit cards at home if you come to the event. The store, it is. It's an awesome store. They've got a huge studio, classroom, really, really cool. And then on the Saturday, the very next day, how awesome is this? Precision Camera and Sony, yeah, Sony, have rented out the entire Q2 Stadium, which is the Professional Soccer League Stadium in Austin, Texas. So we have it for a couple of hours. We're going to have a whole bunch of models. Uh, I think Nanlite is going to be there, if I'm not mistaken, with some lighting. Sony's going to be there with loner gear. We're also trying to get some loner lenses and that from Tamron. So we're going to have a whole bunch of cool stuff. And I'm going to do a demo, and we are going to shoot. And you will have me to guide you and work with you. We're going to create some really, really cool stuff. This stadium, if you've never seen it, really, really modern, really colorful. So a lot of fun. And then the other one that I'm excited about, uh, not just for me, but I, and I realize I've only been talking about my piece of this. So I do want to share just a little more tonight. And I promise we're into the questions. 
uh, Texas School. I've been hearing about Texas School ever since I started teaching. So it's gonna, you know, it's been on my bucket list. It's like one that I really, really want to do because it's a full week. So the way it works, right, there are all these amazing instructors that are gonna be teaching. I mean, like Tony Corbell, right? When it comes to portraits of people, God, this guy's like an icon, okay? All of these people are just amazing instructors. They are all teaching that week. But here's how it works. You register, it's only $750, that's all, for four and a half days of education. But you spend the entire week with one instructor. So you're not switching around, you're not getting all different viewpoints, you're doing a deep dive into the way that instructor works on whatever subject matter it is they're teaching. And, and most of the instructors are doing really kind of like a deep dive into their world, right? And so it's a little bit of everything that they do. For me, do different, be different, and create images that stand out. I mean, does that title surprise you? Because that's always my focus. I don't want to do what everybody else is doing. So this is literally going to be hands-on. It's going to be pretty intense, honestly, because it's, it's everything. The prep, the planning, the shooting, the lighting, the post-processing, and business and marketing. So you get four and a half solid days of instruction working with me. And of course, you're shooting. Trust me, I'm not spending four and a half days lecturing. We're going to be shooting. We're going to be creating all of this crazy stuff that you see me do, calm in the middle of chaos, and the fans, and all of it. We'll have makeup artists. We'll have models. We're going to have a blast, right? So that's coming up uh, April 23rd through the 28th. That's that full week. Um, all the information for that, I'll share that one here. And that's all of my upcoming stuff, okay? Uh, I will tell you that down the road, um, the end of March, oh, excuse me, no, that's not the one I was looking for. Where is it, where is it, where is it? Oh, there's, yeah, there it is. March 14th, uh, I will be doing a presentation called Post-Processing Raw Files, how to develop your images so that they always look their best. This is not really a Photoshop presentation in the sense that I'm gonna show you all kind of like gimmicks and tricks um, this is uh, a program that's done predominantly in Adobe Camera Raw, which is exactly the same as Lightroom. And it's to show you my processing workflow. I find so many photographers today are really just cutting themselves off at the knees with the potential for their images because they don't have a consistent workflow for their processing. You know, the, the equivalent of film developing, the darkroom part, that's camera raw, right? That's, that's what that is. And you should have a consistent workflow. Certainly every image is a little bit different. The numbers are gonna be a little different. The settings will be a little bit different, but you should have a consistent workflow to make sure that you are squeezing everything out of that image that you possibly can, period, right? So anyway, that one comes up uh, uh, March 14th. It's a Tuesday night. And again, that's one where there's a digital download, kind of a cheat sheet, uh, as well as you'll have the ability to be able to watch the presentation for 72 hours afterwards, okay? All right, so uh, let's do the shop breakdown and then we'll do q and I saw a couple more good questions come in, but come on, you're here. That means your photography is not where you want it to be yet. How can I help you, right? So shop breakdown this week, the cover shot, that's the cover shot there, and this one, this is kind of a, honestly, I consider it to be a gimmick. And so I thought, you know what? I want to share this because it's one of those things that I sincerely think every photographer, when they get into lighting and they get at least three lights, because you need three lights to make it work, right? But when you get into lighting, you get at least three lights, you should experiment with this just to do it, just to teach yourself a little bit more about how light and color interact and teaching yourself to see, to be able to see those nuances, right? So the way this shot was set up, and, and I actually, um, well, actually, let me show you the stills and then I'll take you into the software and I'll show you the software breakdown. So basically there's three strobes in this shot, right? So what you're seeing here is one frame with each of the three strobes, right? There's a red strobe, a blue strobe, which is in the middle actually, and then a green strobe, which is on the right. So RGB, right? 
That's basically what's making up these shots. So the three strobes are placed exactly like you see in this picture, and there's the finished result. Now, what I have done in this shot, I have added an overlay for some additional color and also for the bokeh. So to show you what the shot looked without that, here you can see top and bottom. The bottom frame, there is the three strobes lighting the shot. And then the top frame, I did the overlay. The overlay is super simple. It's just putting a texture over top, masking the subject, boom, right? I'm not going to give you a Photoshop lesson on that, so please don't ask because I'm not a Photoshop instructor. Uh, I would encourage you, uh, Picks Imperfect, my buddy Umish Dinda, hands down, in my opinion, the best. He has plenty of videos that show how to do that technique in several different ways, right? But um, what's fun about this is basically the idea that you can take these three colors, and of course, where they overlap, you don't get a pure white, but you get a very functional skin tone. And as you, you know, as you look at these, you can see, whoops, I can only blow it up a little bit. You can see how when we get into the shadows, you're getting, you know, the red shadow on this side, or excuse me, the red color in this shadow, because this shadow is being created by the blue light coming from the other side. And then you're getting green over here, et cetera. It's the blending of the three lights. I did a couple other options, and I'll show you the whole, you know, actual setup in the diagram momentarily. I did a couple of other options. This was actually uh, simply by setting a fan since, and this is important, right? The dress is not a dress that's gonna blow, it's not flowy. And she has an afro, so the fan is also not gonna mess up her hair. There is a fan on camera left behind her. Actually, I apologize, the fan's on camera right behind her and it's aimed across behind her. I have an assistant, my makeup artist, on camera left, who's basically tossing the material into the frame. And then the fan is starting to blow it back as it opens up. That's how you get in the shape. So obviously, it's completely random and it's different every time you, sh you throw it. And if you pay attention, when you throw it and you create a technique and you choreograph the throw, you can actually create a certain amount of control over the shape and how the material responds, et cetera. So it is, it's a, you know, give the model essentially that P word, what's she gonna do, a pose, and then a one, two, three count for the assistant, right? And then watching the material start to unravel and shooting it as it's directly behind the model. Uh, so whoops, similarly, let me go back to here. Here's one with a yellow piece of material, similar concept. Uh, again, just experimenting, just playing, something that you can have a lot of fun with. But I want to show you when I say about experimenting and playing, this is why I wanted to share this image with you. So let me switch over here to um, the setup virtually, let me make this as big as I can, and let's just start from overhead, right? So just to give you a sense of space and distance and everything else, right? I used, I, I left the 10 foot circle here just because you know I talk about the 10 foot circle all the time, so I know that most of you now, when you see that, you realize, oh, that's 10 feet, okay? So I have intentionally moved these three lights back further than you're used to seeing me place lights. Also, I want to point out that this I did this shot with Godox 8200s. The software doesn't show a Fresnel head for the 8200 yet. I'm working with them to do that. So for now, that's why it's got the seven inch reflectors on there, but I did not have bare bulb and seven inch reflectors. You could do it that way. That's not how I did it. I had the Fresnel heads with magma gels over them, right? Real simple. So um, basically, three lights, red, blue, green, as you can see, they are placed fairly close together, right? They're, they're about a foot and a half, two feet apart in space. Um, and why do I have them further away than I normally light? Simply because the closer I put the lights, the more the shadows will start to drift. You can see if you look above me, the closer the light comes, the more the shadow drifts out. The more that I bring it back, the more the shadow stays in. Similarly, if I move the background, let me unlock that. 
if I move the background back, the shadows are going to drift and they fall, right? So certainly I could raise the shadows, but to do that, I would have to raise, or excuse me, lower the lights more. And then if we get too low, we're creating kind of rather odd shadows on the tops of, you know, parts of the model. But certainly we could, we could even play with this a little bit. We could stagger the heights so we get them at various heights. The point is, when I say experiment, this is a situation where every little move has another impact on the shot. So if you play around with this RGB concept, don't be afraid to experiment and do different things. Uh, also, you know, working with different color backgrounds. Now, I did do this shot with a white wall. I will say that the software is rendering the wall a little bit brighter than it rendered in, in real life, but still the software is pretty amazing. So I think to give you a little bit more of kind of a realistic way of how it played out for me in real life, what thunder gray there is, I would go there and you see the colors are a little bit richer, but you could, you know, you could work this off of even different colors for that matter. I mean, we can go ahead and say, Hey, let's try this. What do we get if we do it on an orange background? Right. And you know, then the red turns to pink, you're getting different shades of green and teal because you lose the yellow at that point. So, you know, you can create some really interesting color palettes by playing around with different color backgrounds. It doesn't have to be a white background. That's one of the questions I get all the time when I talk about this shot. It's like, well, does it have to be on white? No, it could be on any color, right? But remember that your RGB, that's going to impact how the colors are seen on the background, right? So all of that are, are, are factors that you can, can bring into the shot. And sure, I mean, if you wanted... You could even still come in, like we could bring in uh, a rim light. I'm going to aim that towards my subject. And um, let's see here. I'm going to bring it, I'm going to bring it kind of close so that we really kind of light her up with this if we can. And what power is that? That's, I'll make it just so that this actually shows off. I'm going to make it a little brighter. And then, you know, we could even put, like if we wanted to get yellow back in, that's orange. Whoops. Where is the yellow? Oh, that's what I want, the bright yellow. So, you know, we can start. And obviously, you see, it's not going to, like, take over the color. Well, yeah, it will. Hold on. There we go. That's what I wanted to happen. Okay. So now, you know, I can create, like, additional accents with a rim light. It helps if you turn it on. That's lesson number one. Turn it on. Okay. Um, the point is have fun. Have fun and experiment. And it's also worth pointing out. Photographers, we are all about our modifiers, right? So let me go back here really quick to, um, whoops, where, what is it I want here? I want the browser. Let me go back to that and I'm going to bring this in. Let me just point out to you how good the skin tones are. Now, remember, we're playing with color. So the goal is not to get like a perfect brown skin tone. You're not, you're not going to get that. Plus, that kind of defeats the whole point, right? But the fact of the matter is, you can get these very interesting skin tones that you can work with. But look how evenly her face is lit. There's no softbox. There's no beauty dish. There's no umbrella. It's three direct flashes. So it's creating nice, soft, even light. Boom. End of conversation, right? That's also why I made sure that I have my lights above her head because I want a little bit of shadow underneath her jawline so that it separates the jaw from the neck, right? But it's a great example that shows you, hey, you don't necessarily have to have big, fancy modifiers for everything that you're doing, okay? So that's this week's shot breakdown. Now, um, I want to scroll all the way back to the beginning. I'll get everybody's questions. If I keep them coming, I just scrolled through. There's not enough. Come on. Uh, we got, what do we got? We got 35 minutes, 34 minutes. So we got plenty here, but I'm going to go back to the first questions. Um, and Corey had a question and I did some quick research for you, Corey, before we came on. Um, and I've got the answer because indeed, if you've never done it before, it's a little, little confusing. So he wants to know, 
What is the tether cord that he would use to tether his OMD EM5 Mark II? So that's an Olympus camera. It's one of the smaller Olympus cameras, I believe 16 megapixels. Uh, and you're now up to what, the Mark III, I think. Um, what would he do? Uh, what would he use to tether that to his laptop for live shoot transferring? He can't find a proprietary USB cord for it anywhere. Okay. So a couple things that you have to know, and also a couple things that you need to check me on, meaning I'm not a thousand percent positive that I've got every little piece of this detail correct, but I'm going to tell you exactly what you need to look up so that you can confirm it, so that you don't spend money and then have it be the wrong thing, right? So here's what I can tell you. Um, first of all, it is a proprietary cord, but proprietary in today's world doesn't mean that it's got to have the name Olympus on it. I would encourage you to use their cord. Yes, it's going to cost you a couple dollars more. Fortunately, this isn't a super expensive cord, right? Um, you can buy off-brand versions of it. So let me actually just switch over here to a browser, and I'm going to show you. So um, this is the Olympus proprietary cord. Now, the trick to this is if you read the specs on this, they're going to tell you, let's see, where do they have it listed here? Whoops, overview. They're going to list all of these kind of off-model Olympus cameras, older Olympus cameras that does not list your uh, EM5 Mark II. But if you do the Q&A and you check, yes, it will work. Basically, you need it to be the USB 6 and it works. And I found that in two other sites. And I can tell you having owned an EM3, the next camera up, uh, and briefly working with the e EM5 Mark II that you have, um, that's the kind of cable, right? So you can, I'll share these links with you in a second. You can buy a generic off-brand one for a dollar less, right? From uh, a Chinese company. In fact, here, let me give you uh, a link to that, and I'll give you a link to the B&H one. So there's the Olympus cord, and let me grab the BNH link. Um, there's the BNH link. Wow, really crazy long link. Okay. Um, but there's one more thing you need to know, and this is the part that you need to double check what I'm about to tell you. Okay. So if I switch over here to Tether Tools, Tether Tools, by the way, for any of you that have not done tethering or, or you don't even kind of know where to start. Tether Tools has incredible resources on their website about tethering and how to tether. So if you do a search on the Tether Tools uh, site for the Olympus EM5 Mark II, um, it's, it's USB-A is, is the type of port that it's using, right? It tells you the camera uses a proprietary cable. We've already established that. Um, if you need a longer cable, you can use their active extension cable because that Olympus proprietary cable is really, really short. So the active extension cables will allow you to expand um, the distance and not have the power drop out, which is kind of important. But one of the words that you used in your question, Corey, I want to make sure that you're doing your research. You say, trans or tether it to your laptop for live shooting transfer. So... If I am not mistaken, I just want to make sure that we're using the phrase live shooting the same way. If I am not mistaken, that camera will allow you to tether so that you press the button and the file transfers immediately. I believe that will work. But I also believe what won't work is in a program like Capture One, where you have the ability to do live preview, meaning see what the camera sees, but see it on your computer screen before you press the button, I don't believe that feature will work, okay? So do a little bit more research, and honestly, what I would encourage you to do, uh, number one, it should talk about it in your camera manual. I didn't spend enough time with that camera, and I no longer have the manuals downloaded onto my system, but check your camera manual, and if it does not talk about those options, uh, go to um, the Olympus website for whatever part of the world that you're in, Corey. Uh, send them a message and ask the question. Uh, I will tell you that even the new company, OMD Solutions, 
is very, very good with their customer service that way. They will respond. They will give you the specific details. But I, I point all that out because I just want to make sure, like, if, if you're going to go out and get all this stuff to do this, I want to make sure that you've got the right expectations for what the camera is capable of doing. Um, smaller cameras and older cameras, many of them will connect to Tether, but it's basically just a file transfer, right? Uh, they're not going to connect and give you live view. So it's all a matter of making sure you have the right expectations, right? And, and of course, um, even the live view is going to depend on which software you're using. With Olympus cameras, you have to use Olympus Capture, which is a great piece of software, by the way. So in case you weren't aware of that also, Corey, um, you can download that for free from the Olympus website. It's called Olympus Capture. Um, that's what you use for tethering. I will tell you what's amazing about it is it is the fastest tether software on the market, hands down. You know, everybody complains about how painful it is to tether, uh, you know, to Lightroom or that, and that they say Capture One is much faster, which it is. Uh, I can tell you as an Olympus shooter, when I was shooting Olympus, Olympus Capture software rendered my file a whole lot faster than Capture One could. And don't get me wrong, Capture One's great software, but um, especially considering Olympus Capture is free, it was great. So uh, they do have a proprietary software also for tethering. So make sure that you download that too, okay? All right, so let's see here. Next question I had on my list here, where was it? From Felipe um, in Brazil. Can you please tell us something about photography as a business? Um, you mean other than like run the opposite direction? No, I'm kidding. Don't do that. But um, he goes on to ask, what do you believe uh, will be the trends for the next five years, for example? So uh, Felipe, I told you that I would address that. And I told you that my answer might surprise you. So here's the thing. Um, I could guess at some trends. But I don't know. And I don't care. And here's why you shouldn't care. So I'm going to give you an answer that I feel is more important to your question. And I hope that you'll understand. Following trends. I really wish trend was spelled with four letters because it would fit my narrative about four letter words a whole lot better, right? But um, anytime you follow a trend, you are making and, and I know many of you have not actually thought it through this way before, but I'm hopefully going to get you to look at trends a lot differently. If you follow a trend, if you buy into a trend and feel, oh, I should do this because there's a demand, anything like that, you are making a choice to have your work not stand out. You are making a choice to have lots of competition. I don't care if it's good, bad, better, or worse, but it's competition. Because remember, good, bad, better, or worse is not defined by you, the photographer, or the next photographer, or Joe Edelman. Good, bad, better, or worse is defined by the people who have the money, right? And people don't always have the highest standards. They just don't, right? So the challenge with trends, I, I mean, I'll give you a great example. And, and look, I have friends who run the photography blogs, Petapixel, DIYphotography.net. Um, I don't know the guys from F-Stoppers, but look, those people work really hard at providing that service. But a lot of what they do, it does not help the industry. It does not help the industry because a lot of what they do is like, AI is going to ruin photography. CGI is going to take away photographers' jobs. This piece of software is going to eliminate the need for this, yada, yada, yada. Right? And what does that do? It creates stress. Well, it starts with anxiety, turns into stress. It creates division. It is a distraction. It's, it's shiny object syndrome. All these photographers are then having all these conversations and all these debates, and they're spending so much time considering 
all these changes. Oh my God, what's it going to do to my livelihood? What's it going to do to my career? What's it going to do to my hobby? Whatever. Instead of focusing on what really matters, taking pictures, doing what they do. I caused a firestorm two weeks ago, week and a half ago. If you've seen on social media, I post a photo quote from a different photographer every single day with a link to their website, which just in case you haven't figured it out yet, gang, I don't care what you think about the quote. For those of you that like to say, yeah, that quote's stupid, or I don't care. You know why I don't care? Because I don't share them for your opinion. It doesn't matter what you think because that photographer was very successful. That photographer does what they do and they do it really, really well. So that quote is their viewpoint. The quotes are shared so that you click on the link and you go look at the photographer's work and you read their bio, read about their career, read about how they became the photographer that they are and learn, learn very valuable things about photography, right? that don't actually require you to have a camera in your hand when you do it. That's why I share them. But I shared one of my favorite quotes that I use routinely when I am teaching business. But of course, since it's just a quote, it's just one piece of the story. And the quote was, as photographers, we make money by doing what we do to the best of our ability and then finding the people dumb enough to pay us for it. Well, you'd have thought the world was ending because, you know, first off, there were the people that just found the word dumb offensive. Then there were the people that are like, so you're telling your clients that they're dumb because they pay you. Well, first of all, all of you are my clients. So I guess if you pay me, you're dumb. But that's not the point behind the quote because the bigger context is, it's a way of understanding that Throughout history, that's how artists and creatives have survived. You can go back to the master artists. None of them made a lot of money in their lifetimes. But what most of them did is they found people dumb enough. Because, man, this is a stretch. They found people that would put a roof over their heads, give them a place to sleep, put clothes on their back, feed them, pay for their supplies so that they could spend their time creating. And they did this in exchange for their art. These people got to keep their art, right? At the time when that was happening, those people were kind of crazy because those people had no idea what that art would be worth. And certainly back then, that art was not worth a fraction of what it's worth now. But yet these people supported these artists, right? So. You know, it's a way of getting photographers to, to think about it, essentially. So to go back to your, your question, um, as far as, you know, what are the changes and what are the trends going to be, Felipe? The reason why I don't think there's really going to be any major changes in five years is because there will be a very substantial part of our industry, and this includes both amateurs and professionals, that are going to invest a lot of personal energy into stressing about, oh my God, the sky is falling, the world is ending, AI is taking our jobs, yada, 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 yada. Social media sucks, Instagram doesn't show my pics anymore, it doesn't do this, doesn't do that, boom. I know a lot of photographers who in the last year and a half have grown their businesses because they actually finally said, you know what, screw this Instagram stuff. I'm wasting my energy here. So, you know, there's gonna be this large portion of the industry that gets all focused on these changes because it's change and change, change scares some people. Change causes some people stress. Then there are people like myself, change is exciting. Change is opportunity. Change is the ability to start fresh. Change is energizing. It's exciting. So a big part of the equation is how do you approach it? How do you choose to look at it, right? 
you can look at it from the standpoint of, oh my God, you know, and, and here's the thing, like this is a fact, statement of fact, no opinion. There is nothing bad about AI, fact. In our photography industry, no one has created an AI that is causing damage to anyone. They are not yet capable of doing that. Uh, look, could that come? Sure, but here's the trick. So what makes AI so bad? It's people that abuse AI, not AI abusing people. And even down the road, if AI becomes a problem, a specific AI, because there are multiple AIs, right? There's many of them. But if one AI becomes a problem, it will become a problem because people have programmed it that way. While these AIs are incredible, they're not completely sentient yet, right? They're not entirely capable of, of growing their mindsets on their own. They have to be fed, right? So, you know, are there going to be problems with AI? Sure because of the people take advantage of it. In fact, I just saw something in, in the photo blocks today. Where is it? Uh, some guy, was this down in Australia? Because, you know, those Australians, man, you got to watch them. I know there's a couple here. Happy Thursday. Um, let's see, where. let me find this article here really quick. I saw it literally right before I came on about uh, some well-known Instagram photographer that I've never heard of, but apparently all or most of his work is AI. Um, uh, uh, here we go. So here, let me, I'll change this over to the browser and I'll read along with you guys. So, uh, Insta famous photographer fesses up that his photographs are all AI generated. So here we'll switch. Um, Joe's Avery. So he's got 20,000 plus followers. I, I don't know, 27,000 plus followers. I don't know that I would call that Insta famous, but, uh, all of his images were created by mid journey. Um, yeah, you know, I, I don't, I mean, if the guy's been lying about it, well, yeah, he's been outed and, you know, he's a loser. But look, at the same time, here, let me do this. Uh, I, I've i been following, wow, if I could type, I might be dangerous here. Instagram. <laughs> um, I have been following a photographer on Instagram that has been doing the most amazing stuff with AI, but he's extremely open about it. Yeah, Tim Tatter. So here, and I will, oh, no, 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 no. I don't want to log in right now. Don't make me log in. Uh, all right, so the guy's name, I'll type it in the chat, uh, and then you can look it up. Tim Tatter. Um, he is a brilliant commercial fashion photographer in his own right, but he believes in exploring, and he talks about it. So if you read some of his posts, he, he actually discusses a, a lot of this in his posts, right? He talks about the, the idea that he believes in really digging into new technologies and learning about them and seeing how much you can stretch them and pull them and what you can do with them. And man, I'll tell you what, he, he works, I think, primarily with MidJourney. He has been doing some of the most brilliant stuff. And I love it. I think it's incredible. It's not done with a camera. It's all done with AI. But at the end of the day, he's creating. He's doing this to see what it takes from a prompt standpoint, because that's how AIs work. And AI is only as good as the prompt that you give it, right? He's figuring out what are the best prompts? How do I get you know these, these AIs to create these incredibly detailed images that are themed? So interestingly enough, like he's got he's got a series several series of images that he's done where he basically works in these different styles. And I'm telling you, they're brilliant. I don't see that as the sky is falling. I see that as, hey, it's really cool. Now, ultimately, does that mean I'm going to go do it? No. I've been dabbling with AI to create backgrounds. You know, I do lots of compositing. But for me, I like the photographic process. So the idea of having a computer take away the human interaction for me I'm not threatened by it. I'm just not, I'm not interested in it, right? So, you know, again, it's a, a lot of people are going to get so hung up in that stuff and they're going to waste time. So that's what, honestly, that's what I predict. If you take away that, that portion of our industry, the rest of the industry, it's going to be business as usual. 
there are still going to be companies, there are still going to be people that need good photography, and there will still be photographers focused on providing good photography. One of the things that we have to realize and be aware of, and it's easier for us old guys to understand this, because we've lived through more of the history. You know, go back 30 years, there were way fewer photographers. Go back 50 years, there were way fewer photographers yet. Digital technology comes along, the new, the new you know, millennium hits, boom, photography explodes, which is awesome. The fact that photography is so accessible to people that you can make incredible images with little to no knowledge base. That's incredible. It really is. But that's the point. Being able to make amazing images with little to no knowledge base gets you to here. Being able to pay your bills and make a good living requires you getting up here with your capabilities. There's no foundation under this. You have to build the foundation. You have to build the skills. You have to build the knowledge. The tech, no matter how good the tech is, no matter how automated it is, it will only take you so far. And you can't find me a photographer who's beaten those odds. You just can't, right? So you'll still have a, a portion of photographers just like you do today that are making good money, that are doing great photography, that are innovating, that are being creative, and you don't hear them bitching, you don't hear them complaining, you hear them really excited about new stuff, like the things you hear me say, like the things you'll read if you go to Tim Tatter's profile and look at his stuff, and make sure you go look at his photography too, because that's honestly, to me, that's part of, big part of what makes it interesting. You know, he's got a very distinct style in his photography, and, and believe me, it's bright and bold and colorful and graphic, and he's, he's bringing that so you can see his influence in the images he's creating with the AIs. It, it's honestly, I'm sorry, but it's really cool. I, I don't see it as bad or as a threat. So Felipe, I hope that helps. I, I mean, honestly, it really does. Um, I understand probably the reason you're thinking of that question is like, well, okay, good. You know, what, what might be a little tidbit that I can kind of get ahead of the curve? Honestly, the best thing to do is stay away from the curve altogether, right? Pick a straight line to where you want to go follow that line. Let everybody else go do their thing because let's face it, anytime you go around a curve, you got to slow down and it takes longer. Just saying, right? Figure out where you want to go, put the pedal to the metal, do the work and you'll get there faster. You will, right? Because unfortunately, there's no shortcuts. People follow the trends. They think that's a shortcut. They think, oh, it's going to be easier to make money. Oh, you know, it's like th that. that's how to be popular, whatever. Not even close. So, all right, uh, a couple other questions that were in here. Let me get back down to where they were. Patrick, how do you come up with your creative shoots? Drugs. No, seriously, I don't do drugs. Never have. I, I, was, I was a nerd. Um, do you find interesting props and create based on that or come up with a mood board first? So, you know, and actually, that's a great question. You should definitely sign up for those two classes I was talking about, Patrick. Uh, but I'll give you the, the short version. I don't do mood boards. I have worked with mood boards with various clients who liked mood boards. For me, I just kind of do it up here in my head, right? So mood boards are not bad. Mood boards are an excellent way. And I'll be talking about mood boards in my mastering creativity course because they're actually very valuable tools. Uh, but in terms of where do the ideas come from? First and foremost, you build a habit. It's a habit of looking for ideas. It's a habit of being open, being able to absorb ideas and being able to spot ideas. So for me, I have developed the habit over the years that I look at everything through the lens, pun intended, of what could I create with that? Or what could I create from that? Or what could I create because of that? Meaning, uh, maybe it's an interesting texture or an interesting set of colors. And how might I use that color combination or those textures, right? Um, and then it's the idea of, um, the science version, and I'm not going to give you my whole presentation, but it's using divergent and convergent thinking, right? And, and that's really kind of the mix and match process and then the solve the problems process put together. And that's where the ideas come from. But I do not have a standardized start here and end up here. Sometimes I start here. Sometimes I start all the way here and got to go back to the beginning to get the rest of it to get over to here. 
right? It all depends. Sometimes my ideas start with a person's face because it's a really interesting face, or they may start because that person has a really interesting hairstyle. Other times it may honestly just start because, oh, look at that outfit that model's wearing on Instagram. Do you own that outfit? If you have that outfit, I'd really love to shoot that outfit, right? It could start anywhere. So it's, it's honestly a matter of developing the habit of looking at things in a way of what can I take, what can I steal, what can I use, and then turning that into my own image, right? Great ideas are stolen all the time, but never copied. And that's the thing. Steal until your heart's content, but don't copy, right? Um, you know, copies, we've all done zero access before, right? Copy is never good as the original, and it's not. And I'm a big believer, if you're going to go out and copy somebody's work, for the purpose of learning, I'll give you the benefit of the doubt. You're going to copy somebody's work for the purpose of learning. If you post that work on social media, then I'm sorry. As far as I'm concerned, you should send a check to the person whose work you copied because you just devalued their work with your cheap copy because your copy is not going to be better than their original. It's just not, right? You copy it to learn. You copy it to master technique. And then you go about tweaking it and making it your own, okay? Um, let's see here. Eric, what was the name of the 3D software that you're using? It's called Set a Light 3D. But here, let me type it in so you can actually find it because there's a bunch of periods in there. Um, and then I have to give you my standard disclaimer since you asked about it. Uh, not a bad thing, but very, very important disclaimer, Eric. So uh, this is their website. I'm going to share the link in the chat. So a couple of things. One, they do have a free download. Do not buy this immediately until you try the free download. Uh, most of you do not need this software. It's cool. It's extremely powerful. It's extremely accurate. But also, before you even download it, I want you all to remember the first time, the very first time, that you opened up on your computer Lightroom or Photoshop. The very first time. So I want you to think back to the moment where that interface pops up on your screen and you go, whoa, there's going to be a learning curve here. There's a learning curve. So the software is amazing. Uh, there's two versions of it. There's a basic and a studio. Um, almost none of you need the studio. But uh, the basics more than enough. So yeah, $84 compared to $169. Uh, I will tell you that if you are a member of my Tog Knowledge community, you can get a um, substantial discount in, in my Tog Knowledge community. It's not an affiliate link. I don't make money on it. I just have a good relationship with the creators of the software. And I've, I've been able to have some input. Some of the stuff that's in that software I've, I've had input on, which is also kind of cool to be... Uh, you know, to have been a part of that. So, uh, all right, let's see here. Going back to the questions, what else do we have? Um, Patrick said here, did I, uh, oh wait, sorry. Um, Gerhard, how do you create the green circle on the floor in the software? I already saw this in an older videos. It's useful for keeping the same distance when I'm moving the lights. Uh, yeah, it, it, in the software, it's, a, it's an upside down cone, Gerhard. Um, so here, I, I don't want to do a, tutorial uh, on the software, but I'll, I'll show you really quick how I did it. So uh, this, if you, whoops, where are we at here? I got to get to my list and I have a feeling it's going to freeze on me now. Whoop, there we go. Let's back this out. Let me scroll down and let me get rid of my doc. I'm going to take my, my self off the screen. Um, so you can see that down here, it's a cone that I basically just reversed it. So if I were to, um, whoop, gotta unlock it and then I can show you, there we go. So if I were to touch that, um, it's a cone that I've changed the height so that it's basically like zero height and I've just laid it down on the floor. That's, that's it. So, um, yeah, they don't have just like a simple circle, but the cone obviously is round at the bottom, okay? Um, in real life, though, Gerhard, you just use string. That's, that's all you need, right? It's just 
just string. Um, hmm. I just lost all of my overlays. How did that happen? Let's go back to there. Well, I don't know how that happened, but you can still see me, so that's good. We'll keep going. Okay. Uh, so I have no idea where the overlays went to, uh, but they literally just disappeared. All right, uh, scroll on down here. Patrick said, I uh, mainly use Capture One and Photoshop. Looking to get an iPad to tether with Capture One. Any recommendations on which iPad? Um, I, I wouldn't get an older model. Some of, my understanding is some of the older models won't support the new Capture One. So before you, you make that decision, Patrick, check the Capture One website as to um, what version of um, the iPad software that they support. Because if you get an older iPad that doesn't support up to that version, you're out of luck, right? Um, I certainly would get, if you're gonna do go to that extent, I would get an iPad Pro for the additional resolution, the additional processing power. Um, you know, and obviously for me, I like big screens. So when I do work with the iPad tethered, uh, I use the, the 12 inch, so I have the bigger screen. But just definitely confirm kind of your software string there, right? as far as buying, certainly by all means buy an older iPad, but remember, you, you do reach a point where uh, third-party manufacturers like Capture One, they're not going to support software, um, you know, operating systems back beyond a certain point. So you always wanna double check that combination, okay? Um, let's see here, Michael, people are way too sensitive these days. I'm too old to get up so upset over people that can't understand context. Well, yeah, Michael, I, I mean, um, so I wouldn't say people are way too sensitive. I mean, I totally get the generational comment, right? Trust me, my wife's a college professor. She deals with, you know, 18 to 22-year-olds on a daily basis. Um, Generation Z, they're very different than Gen X and baby boomers. Um, and, you know, I'll, I'll tell you straight up, and I mean it sincerely, in a lot of ways, I think they're a lot smarter than we were. But the fact of the matter is, it's different, right? So our experience doesn't match with their experience. Um, you know, I think the challenge is for our generation, Michael, not to dump this on your shoulders, but the way I look at it as an educator, uh, I, I think my responsibility is to kind of take my actual hands-on experience with history, meaning the last 50 years of photography, and be able to point out to younger people that when stuff like this AI and all that kind of stuff happens, like, look, let's let's learn a little bit from the past, right? You know, and, and not to sound corny, but we can learn a lot about the future and what's likely to happen in the future by looking at past history. And look, if you don't think that's possible, I have one word, pandemic. Go look at how much we learned from the first pandemic to the second pandemic, the one that we just lived through, pretty much nothing, right? <laughs> That's what we've learned because we repeated so many of the same mistakes. The world, society repeated so many of the same mistakes. But the fact of the matter is, you know, we can go back. We can go back to the Industrial Revolution in America. We can look at the Industrial Revolution and we can look at the time frame and we can look at how all that technology developed and how long it took to become standardized and how it kind of spread. And then we can bring that forward and we can overlay that over the internet and then social media. And we can realize that number one, the internet, social media, all the stuff that we get all up in arms about, even though we accept it as day to day, if it's normal, it's been around for 20 some years, more than that, right? It's still in its infancy. We don't really know where any of it's going, right? So, you know, to me, it's important to take a breath on a lot of this stuff. And it's important, it, it is important, I wanna be clear, you should be paying attention to AI. You should understand it. You should be paying attention to trends, to understand where you don't wanna go, right? But none of that should be causing stress. None of that should be causing worry. You don't stress or worry until it's knocking on your door, right? And if you've been spending all that time in the meanwhile, building your foundational skills and building a business, you'll be able to pivot without any problem, right? If it gets to a point where it's knocking on your door and it's impacting your business. But yeah, people are getting really freaked out about the potential impact before it even impacts, okay? Um, so let's see here. Did I miss any other 
Good questions. And uh, Eric, I don't use OBS. I use, uh, I'm a Mac guy. I hate Windows. Um, I use Ecamm Live. So much easier. Okay. Um, and scrolling on down here. Uh, Digital QI, could you use it for product work? Yeah, actually, quite a few people do. Um, if one of the cool things they also do, they, they maintain a, a pretty vibrant online community where uh, people share images and set files and that, and actually even share them through the program. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, you'll find a lot of product people uh, doing stuff. And they've added a lot more in the last several months that really accommodates product photographers in terms of shapes and things like that. Um, and they keep developing it and keep adding to it. So yeah, I mean, they're, they're not resting on their laurels. They're really pushing it. Michael, okay, that was actually a reference to people getting upset over your quote you posted. Cool. And I mean, uh, yeah, overall, we agree, right? Um, but it is, it's, it's kind of one of those things that um, the world's going to change, folks, whether we like it or not, right? And so for me, I, I just kind of take the approach. Look, I, I have days where I'm grumbling under my breath and it's like, that change, it's annoying. I wish it wasn't happening, you know, but then I kick myself in the butt at the end of the day and say, look, it's changing whether you want it to or not. So what is it that really matters to me? What is it that really matters to me and my photography? You know, what do I do? And, and what can I do and go forward? And then that way there's much less stress, right? Um, so yeah, I, I mean, Everybody's going to deal with things a little bit differently, but I find that looking forward and that little piece of unknown, right? And that that little piece of adventure, that keeps things exciting and it keeps things interesting. And it it's always going to present a new challenge. And I'm sorry, gang, but at least in my opinion, challenges are good. Challenges are healthy, right? So anyway, gang, that being said, you guys have been awesome. Another great discussion. We got like a three-week string going here. Keep it going. This has been really good, but we're out of time. I want to thank all of you for watching. I sincerely hope that you found some value in the things that we talked about tonight and what I shared. Uh, remember, hitting a thumbs up helps other people find out about the show. And of course, you don't get back the days that you waste. So please go pick up that camera and shoot something because your best shot, it's your next shot. Hashtag do the work, gang. Adios. Have a great week. Take care.